Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's program. Tonight, we'll begin with a welcome for, from our chapter, President Sabrina Clark. Good evening. As president of the Atlanta Suburban Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and on behalf of our members, I would like to welcome you to the Making Moves with Investments and Wills webinar as part of our Smart Money Moves series. As we begin 2022, it is so important to focus on physical, mental, and financial health. I know we all work hard for our money, and tonight we will learn ways to allow our money to work for us. In addition, it is imperative that we begin taking the necessary steps to leave a legacy for our family. Whether you are a novice in investing, looking to expand your existing portfolio, or desire to begin the estate planning process, we hope there will be information shared tonight that will aid you in the journey. A special thank you to our presenters, Camila Elliott and Valentia Aline. Thank you all for joining us and please enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Madam President, for that warm welcome. My name is Terry Crook, and I'm the only legal crook in the chapter. And I want to just start off with some little housekeeping tips. First, we want to tell you about our media disclaimer. Now, you have entered an area where photography, audio, and video recording will occur. And as a matter of fact, it is occurring. So by entering the event premises, you consent to such recording media and its release, publication, exhibition, or reproduction. Now, we have everyone's mic muted because we want you to engage uh, in the event, but we have you muted so that you can hear the speaker. But again, we want you to engage with us in the chat. So what we want you to do is look down at the bottom next to the chat where it says Q&A. That's where we want you to enter your questions, okay? Not in the chat next to the chat where it says Q&A. Please enter your questions. And we have some awesome ladies standing by to uh, gather your questions and make sure to ask them at the appropriate time. All right, so without further ado, let me introduce you to this awesome speaker that we have in the house with us today. Her name is Miss Camila Elliott, and she is the president of GRID 202 Partners, a financial planning firm with locations in Washington, DC, Georgia, and North Carolina. She has nearly two decades of financial planning and investment experience assisting high net worth individuals, endowments, and foundations, and business owners with comprehensive wealth solutions and holistic planning. Camila spent most of her professional career at Vanguard working with ultra high net worth individuals and endowments and foundations, inclusive of major universities, hospitals, and other charitable organizations throughout the Southeast US. Her client relationships range from 20 million to 450 million and represented 3 billion in total assets. Yes, you heard me right. 3 billion in total assets prior to leaving her role. She also worked at Dimensional Fund Advisors supporting financial advisors and investment solutions to meet the unique needs of their clients. Camilla is on the board of directors for the CFC board. Now, the CFC Board of Directors is the policymaking and oversight body of Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards, Inc., for over 90,000 financial professionals in the U.S. She will be the chair of the CFC Board in 2022, and she just may be hot on the chair today, okay? The first African-American woman and youngest ever to serve in that role. Oh, man, <laughs> wow. She serves on the Investment Committee for Women Against Abuse, Inc., located in Philadelphia, PA, and has been an active volunteer with the IRS Volunteer Income Tax Assistant Program, also known as VITA. 
She obtained her BA and MBA from the Pennsylvania State University, and she's a certified financial planner and holds licenses for life, health, and long-term care insurance. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you Miss Kamala Elliott. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen here. Thank you, ladies. It's a pleasure um, to be with all of you this evening. Um, and I'm excited to impart some financial knowledge and talk about making moves with your investments. So you already learned a little about me, so let's just dig into today's agenda. So today we're gonna to talk about why you should invest. We're gonna discuss stocks and bonds, real estate, mutual funds and exchange traded funds, diversification, and the vehicles that can help facilitate all of these wonderful investments. So to kick it off, why should you invest? Well, let's take a look back down memory lane. In 2021, the S&P 500 index, for those of you that may not know what that is, the S&P 500 are the top 500 largest securities in the US market. It includes companies that many of you know well, Apple, Tesla, um, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, all these companies that you know well. Last year, even during the pandemic, the market performance for the S&P 500 was 26.9% for this S&P ETF. I think many of you would be okay with earning about 27% of your return on your portfolio. This is the power of investing. And investing has been a long-term upward trajectory. Over the past five years, and even when you think about the past five years, it's been a really tumultuous ride, right? You think about what happened in March of 2020 during the pandemic, the market corrected or crashed, as some may say, as you can see by the red arrow that's pointing downward. But even over, you know, thinking back through the pandemic and that market decline, if you are someone that has been invested in the market, the market has almost doubled um, since 2019. So 2019, the market was up 31.5%. Um, in 2020, it was up about 18.4. And again, as I mentioned before, last year up about 27%. So the markets have been proven to be really resilient and have had generated really long-term returns. And that's why we are really focused on making sure individuals like ourselves are properly invested in the market. And I'm going to um, talk a little bit more for our community. So the power of growth is why you invest. And as we know, we're heading into an inflationary environment. If you're someone that is buying groceries, you know, prices are going up. If you're someone who's purchasing a home right now or renovating your home right now or buying gas, you know that inflation is starting to, to, to kick in. What happens when you invest is you ensure that your money does not erode in value due to inflation. So the overall market rate, oops, excuse me, the overall market rate for most investments is about nine, 10%. And then inflation kicks in at 2%. And then you have a growth rate of about seven. And so it allows your money to earn money for you, but it helps not to erode value. And this is really important, particularly for our community. One of the things that I didn't share, but I'll, I'll share now is I, I did a white paper with a large, um, another large investment firm last year, and it was all about the black wealth gap and why do blacks have less assets than whites? Now we can go down history lane of um, things like the Homestead Act and redlining and um, inability to access credit in a meaningful way. But we also talked about investing. And one of the things that we noticed with investing is that many Black households had less money all allocated to stocks versus white households. We tend to have more money in cash, 
We tend to have more money in savings or CDs or money markets compared to our white counterparts. Those assets only generate returns of about 2% versus 7% or higher in stocks. And so over time, not having your money invested in stocks, but assets that don't really create a real return helps you know, erode our value or reduce our ability to really gain and garner wealth. And I'll talk through that, even though investing can be volatile, we're actually in a really volatile time right now, if you're following, um, the market's been pretty up and down over the past um, three weeks. But over the long term, the market tends to be resilient and sustained and offer a return of about nine to 10% annually every single year. So when you think about ways to invest, here's a quick snapshot of the overall ecosystem. So there's four categories of investments. There's investments that help create capital appreciation, those that help with capital preservation, those that I mentioned help with inflation protection, so your, your money is not losing as prices increase. And the last is alternatives, which has been really popular as of late particularly as it focuses on more inclusion of more diverse communities. So capital appreciation, those are things like domestic equities, US equities or US stocks. There is also international equities, which is investing abroad, developed markets, which includes you know, countries like the UK or France or Germany or New Zealand. There's also things like emerging markets, like China and Brazil and Russia. And so those, those typically have the highest level of return for most average US investors. High yield bonds are also capital appreciation. And what high yield bonds are, if you don't know what they are, bonds are when you lend money to someone. Now, high yield means that company doesn't have good credit. Right. So, you know, if you know someone who doesn't have good credit and they ask you for a loan, you're not going to give them the standard interest that everyone gets. You're going to ask for more interest because them defaulting on the loan is a little bit higher than normal. So these high yield bonds tend to have almost equity like returns, but you're still, you know, have some level of you're still a debtor to that organization. The next is um, capital preservation. So this is what maintains your overall investments, or this is more short-term in nature. So capital preservation, this includes CDFIs. These are community development financial institutions. So um, small banks and organizations that help lend money. For those that may be interested, there has been a, um, a huge, um, increase in CDFIs that help support people of color or female entrepreneurs. So you invest your money in the CDFI, they loan that money to a woman or to a person of color to start their business, and then you get that level of return. The others are like private real estate investments or money market. Um, so these are ways that you can help maintain your, your dollar and get, some, get an incremental level of return. Inflation protection, U.S. bonds, um, municipal bonds, what municipal bonds are, are county bonds. So like, for example, we're in Atlanta. These are bonds that DCAP County would offer, Gwinnett County, Cobb County. Um, when they're looking to build infrastructure, they issue bonds and they give you an interest rate. And it's designed to keep pace with inflation. And also utilities. These are Georgia Power. For those in Charlotte, Duke Energy. Um, these are companies that tend to do well, have steady streams of income because people have to have utilities and they give you a return on your investment. And the other are alternatives. Now, alternatives are typically not open to everyone. And they're typically only allocated to individuals that are considered higher net worth. And so what higher net worth is are individuals that have income over the past two years of over 200,000 or couples that have assets of over 300,000, or if you have an, a net worth of over a million dollars, excluding the value of your home. So these are deemed um, alternatives because they're riskier. And these are these startup companies, like you're a day one investor, so venture capital, private equity, 
are, are in that kind of framework. Hedge funds are where, if you watch Billions, Billions is a hedge fund, um, but Billions is where they make small bets on stocks and they will say that the stock will go down. I'm gonna bet the stock will go down. It's a riskier type of investment overall. Um, real assets and angel investments. Like an angel investment would be something like if you watch Shark Tank, um, they're coming in, they're buying, they have some level of ownership of a company. So this is the overall framework of what investing looks like. But let's dig into those that are more typical for most of us and how we invest day to day and how we invest for retirement. So they're public equities or stocks um, is, is another word, way to express it. So when you own a stock, you are a part owner of the company. So you are considered an owner. If you have Amazon stock, you're an owner of Amazon and Jeff Bezos has to report to you. Same with Tesla and Elon Musk, okay? Um, when you are a public owner though, you're on the bottom of the capital structure of a company. So bondholders are paid first and you have access to the remaining cash flow. But because your risk is higher, your return is higher. So how do you make money by buying stocks? Well, the goal is to buy low and sell high. So stocks trade all throughout the day, all throughout the year in different prices. So if you bought a stock at $5 and now it's $10, you now get that level of appreciation. The other way is through dividends. And particularly older companies, more companies that have been around for a long time, have really good cash flow, they'll give you a cash payment every single quarter to all of their stockholders, okay? So let's talk about value versus growth. And the reason why I'm talking about value versus growth is the market has been really volatile right now. So I'm not sure if you guys know this, but any, anyone fans of Peloton? If you are a fan of Peloton, and you bought their stock, you are now down over 75%. Um, there are certain types of stocks that do well in certain types of markets. And what we're seeing right now is that stocks that thrive during the pandemic, like Peloton or even Zoom, Zoom is down, it was 400 and I think $50 a share. I think now it's trading at 160. There's a lot of volatility with it. So people are expecting the market to have some volatility over the next year or so, particularly because we expect that interest rates will go up. When interest rates go up, there tends to be some contraction in the market. And how we position portfolios will change. So here's an example of a defensive stock and a growth stock. So Johnson & Johnson, everyone knows who Johnson & Johnson is, right? baby powder, um, you know, COVID vaccine, et cetera. They've been around for a really, really long time. Um, consistent, what people buy, they always need. You always need household items. So over the past 10 years, they've had an average return of about 13%. They actually even give you a dividend of 2.53%. And over the past 30 years, the highest return has been 56%. And the lowest has been 17%, 17.63. Let's contrast with Microsoft. Over the past 10 years, the average return is 31.55, which is fantastic. The dividend yield is much lower, 0.8. The highest return over the past 30 years or so has been 124% in one year, an amazing amount. But contrast, the lowest return has been 40, negative 46% in one year. So when you invest in companies like this, you have to understand that value companies, yes, the return may be a little bit lower, but the swing and the volatility is much lower too versus companies like Microsoft. Yes, if you want to get that 31.55% annual return or get 124% in one year, you may have to be able to withstand a low or a negative of 46%. And if you're someone that won't be able to sleep at night when you see that, 
maybe Microsoft's not right for you or having a small amount in Microsoft is probably better for you because of the swing. So typically for us, when we think about portfolios, like when we're heading into a market, like we're heading to now, many people have a preference for a Johnson & Johnson, knowing that we're gonna have some volatility versus looking at a company like Microsoft. I'm gonna answer a couple of questions. So one question we have here is, potentially can working with investing benefit the upward inflation growing in Atlanta? A lot of it feels like it's occurring due to the growing, the disproportionate wages we earn in comparison. Um, yes, so what you can do to mitigate um, that level of, uh, you know, inflation is to invest in things that keep pace with inflation. So it's basically being able to invest your money in stocks or high yield bonds, not letting your assets like sit in the money market or a bank account or, or um, investment vehicles that have a lower return. So it's taking your funds, taking your savings and having them work for you. Or also, particularly in the Atlanta area, um, and we'll talk about real estate in a few minutes as well. There are parts of Atlanta that have not had full participation in the real estate market. Areas that I hate to say this word that are more gentrified, have not been gentrified, right? So when you look at ways to keep up with investing in Atlanta, um, take advantage of Atlanta's you know, business growth and things like that and companies are coming here, it's more thinking through um, how you would um, determine those areas and potentially invest in areas that could see some growth. Okay, great. All right, so let's talk, one second here. Let's talk about bonds. So a bond is simply a debt, as I mentioned before. Um, your bar, you, an organization is asking for money and you're giving money to a company and they give you a fixed amount of interest every single month. And bonds are less volatile than stocks, but they also have, um, they have less upside too. So again, higher risk, higher reward, lower risk, lower reward. But bonds for many people aren't sexy um, because you don't hear, I made 80% of my bond portfolio, but they do have a meaningful part of your portfolio. And I think it's important for you to know why um, you shouldn't have 100% of your stock, your money in stocks. So the same thing with um, stocks is the same thing with bonds. Your goal is to buy low and sell high. And then every single month you get a cash payment that's made to all bondholders. But here's the contrast and comparison of why bonds are good. Bonds are shock absorbers. So when the U US equity markets are down, bonds tend to be up. So for example, I'll share with you a story that many of you probably know about. Um, in 2008, we had that US debt crisis. Remember when people were losing their homes to foreclosure, the markets were down almost about 40%. And I remember watching this episode of 60 Minutes. I'm a big fan of 60 Minutes. And it were people who were planning to retire soon. Um, they wanna retire in three or four years. And they were talking about how they can't retire now because their portfolio was down 40%, right? Can you imagine you had a million dollars saved and you want to retire in two years and you look down and you see it's 600,000, right? Um, it would be sticker shock. It would be, um, you know, it would delay your ability to retire based upon plan. Well, the people that were talking about their portfolios that are down, 40%, they were all stocks. And if they had a financial advisor like myself, that might have happened. If you're someone, sorry guys, I have a call, so I apologize. <coughs> if you're someone who was looking to retire in the next two to three years, maybe 60% stocks and 40% bonds or 50-50, Instead of losing 40% of your account, maybe 20%. And you'd have made that back up in about two years. So here's how bonds and stocks contrast. 
Over the past 39 years, bonds were positive 35% of the time, excuse me, 35 times, stocks 31 and 39. But I'll bring your attention to the lowest return. The lowest return we've seen in bonds over the past 30 years, negative 3% versus negative 37%. That's why bonds are important. It should be part of your portfolio. Next um, asset class we'll talk about is real estate. Why invest in real estate? Well, real estate, <coughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. Why invest in real estate? Real estate is tangible and easy to understand. You can drive by a house and see a property, right? You can maintain the property. And the historical returns do tend to outpace inflation. On average, real estate has a return of about 5.5%. And they're diversified. Real estate doesn't typically work the same as markets do. So again, like stock markets are up. Now it's a little bit different. Like real estate's up because of the fact that there was a labor shortage due to the pandemic. That's what's driving real estate prices up so high too as well. But typically they do not work in sync. They're very different in nature. And they're also a source of generational wealth. As many of you know, properties are held in families for years and years and years. It's easy to pass down. There's the family memories. There's an attachment there that's really, really important. You can also leverage real estate. So once your mortgage is paid off, what can you do? You can take a home equity loan against a property, take that leverage, take that value, and then turn it over to a, another property and use that as a down payment or do other investing endeavors. And also tax advantages for real estate. As many of you know, particularly if you use real estate as a primary residence, when you sell a property you've lived in for two out of the past five years, you do not pay tax on the first $250,000 of, of, um, of um, income or gain or $500,000 if you're married. Basically, the entire amount is tax-free. Again, two out of the past five years. So it's a huge benefit that you have that you know you can have that gain and take that gain tax free and leverage it somewhere else. Also, the things you can deduct on when your taxes with real estate. So personally, you can deduct property taxes and you can deduct your mortgage interest. Also, if you are an investor for real estate, you can deduct almost everything. And you also have something called depreciation. So depreciation means you can deduct part of the value of the property every single year you own it. So I hate to say his name, but people always ask me, how did Donald Trump be able to only pay taxes for 750 a couple years, or I guess when they researched his taxes? The reason why he did it is because he had a portfolio full of real estate. And he was able to deduct his taxes, his insurance, the repairs. A lot of those things that he did um, were able to um, reduce his tax liability as he maintained those properties. Okay. So I'm going to stop here for questions. Um, Jasmine, I'm going to go ahead and um, answer this question a little bit later. But would I suggest buying a fixer upper as a first investment? Um, it depends, right? Um, it depends. The reason why is, uh, well, right now, it makes sense to buy a fixer upper if what is most important to you is affordability. Um, as you may know, the home market is up significantly, right? Existing home sales have been up, you know, over the past year, prices have been up. But the prices that we're seeing increase more are new construction. So new construction up about 20%, but existing home sales up about 14%. So if you're trying to derive some value from buying real estate, your biggest is to be able to purchase an existing home. 
Now, fixer upper, right? That's the key. How much fixer upping does the house need, right? If it's just a, um, a little bit about um, like a small renovation, like remodeling a kitchen or a bathroom or putting new floors in, yes. But one thing you do want to make sure that when you do buy a true fixer upper, I mean, knocking walls out or there's infrastructure issues is to have a well-trusted carpenter contractor. Um, you know, what I've learned, and actually I visited a friend recently, I was in um, LA, she bought this beautiful home and she was knocking walls out, is making sure you understand the true cost of fixing it up, that you have a good inspector, you, uh, while you're visiting these properties initially, you have a contractor that you're working with that can look and see that, you know, perhaps this is a load bearing wall, or perhaps, you know, this HVAC unit may need replacing or other just structural issues to make sure that it's really a good deal. And the cost savings you get from buying an existing home are not, um, I would say, eroded by potentially making significant renovations or not having good people that you can trust as contractors. Um, the next question is, what is a baby step investment you can do if you're intimidated by investments? I'm going to talk about that in one second. Um, and we'll talk about index funds in one moment. So perfect timing here. Okay. So building a portfolio. So someone asks, what's a good baby step? A good baby step is don't put all your eggs in one basket. And instead of investing individual stocks and bonds, you can buy a fund that holds hundreds of different stocks and bonds. So examples is like VOO is a simple way to invest. It holds the stocks in S&P 500. Or if you're into tech, QQQ holds all of those. So that's a great way to invest and do it in baby steps. Now having a risk of getting a Peloton and having your portfolio down 75% or a Netflix and you're down 20%, they're low cost and they're well diversified. And here's why being low cost and diversified is so important. So as I mentioned before, if you're in an all stock portfolio in 2001, your portfolio dropped 48%, excuse me, 45%. Versus if you were in a 60-40, you were down 60% stock, 40% bonds, you were down 21%. Same thing for 2008, nine, if you were all stocks, you were down max 51% versus a stock and bond at 31%. So if you're a baby step person, if you're learning about investing, make sure one, you're diversified, but bonds and stocks are really important to allocate to make sure you don't see too much loss when markets swing significantly. Now here are mutual funds and ETFs. So mutual funds are a basket of diversified investing vehicles. So a mutual fund is where there's actual portfolio manager picking and buying and selling. Um, typically, most mutual funds have higher expenses. So 0.5% or 2%. Because you're paying for a portfolio manager, you're paying for a team of analysts, um, you're paying for marketing, all those fees. Now, when looking at mutual funds or um, to purchase them, one important question to ask is, is there a sales charge? Now, <coughs> sorry. When you look at sales charge, some mutual funds will say, before you invest $1 in this fund, we're going to charge you 1% or 2%. And some have no charge at all. So when, you, when someone solicits a mutual fund for any of you, one question you want to ask is, what are the fees of this fund? So will I be charged a fee up front before I even earn $1 of 1%, 2%, 3%? Or is it no low, which means there's no sales charge at all? And as you would imagine, the sales charge typically goes to the advisor or a salesperson for selling you that product, okay? 
And most mutual funds are either active or passive, which means active, that mutual fund manager is picking individual stocks. I like Peloton. I like Netflix. I like Tesla. Let me have a fund of 30 stocks and I'll manage them. Passive tends to be things that are like matched to an index. So a popular index that you can look at is like the S&P 500 or also the um, Russell 3000, Russell 1000, or Russell 2000. The Russell 3000, 1000, 2000 are like all the mark, all the stocks in the U.S. market pretty much. Index funds are much cheaper than active funds because an index, all they're doing is replicating from what um, an index has. There's no one picking and choosing. It's given to them and they invest. So, <coughs> I'm so sorry. So, I didn't cough all day long and I'm coughing now, so I really apologize. Um, so ETFs um, are typically index funds. They're very low cost. They don't have anyone that's picking or choosing the stocks. And so their expenses are much different. So it goes from 0.5 to 2% if it's a mutual fund to 0.05 to 1% for an ETF. And then ETFs typically do not have any sales charges. And most of them are no load and they're very inexpensive. So it's a great way to invest if you're really focused on lowering your cost of investing. All right, now this also goes to diversification. If you're a chemist, you would love this slide. This is the periodic table of investment returns. And what this shows you here is that why you diversify. So let me um, kind of pin into what you should be looking at. This is all of the asset classes from 2001 to 2020 and the highest returning asset class to the lowest returning asset class. So for example, if you look to the top left-hand side, in 2001, the top, <coughs> the top We apologize. If you will hold just one moment, we will try to resume just one moment. Thank you for your patience. Ms. Elliott, are you there? Hi, Tiffany, can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. All right, can you see my screen? I can see, you. Uh, we see you, we don't see the screen. Okay, hold on. Okay. 
I don't know what happened. Can you see my screen now? Um, it says you have started sharing the screen. And yes, we see the uh, periodic table of investment returns. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, yes, we see it. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so what this shares with you is that there's never a clear winner. And that's why it's really important that you don't just pick one stock, you don't pick five stocks, because they tend to perform differently in different markets. <clears throat> you can always pick a winner, you can get lucky, right? If you got Tesla, you got really lucky. But there are a lot of companies that you could have been unlucky in. And having exposure to all the markets is really, really important to make sure you have the return you're looking for. So within that, let's talk about the vehicles that you can invest in. Um, so individually, all of you can invest in a traditional IRA, a taxable account, and a Roth account. And there's also things like employer plans, which are a 401k plan, a pension plan, or self-employed pension plans, and a 403b. So let me talk a little bit about the traditional or the regular individual investing options. So a traditional IRA, as long as you have earned income, um, you can typically invest about six to $7,000. And I'll talk through the details in one moment in a traditional IRA. And the benefit of a traditional IRA is one, if you're not covered under an employer plan, you can typically put about $6,000 in a traditional IRA and it grows tax deferred. So as it grows from 6,000 to 7,000 to 8,000, you don't pay any tax. And then once you retire, you take the money out and that's when the money's taxed. The second is a regular taxable savings account. <clears throat> and why that's important is when you have a regular taxable savings account, yes, you do get taxed on um, interest and dividends along the way. Um, but if you hold an investment for a long time, and according to the IRS, all time is one year, when you are able to um, withdraw, you don't pay taxes like you get paid taxes through working or ordinary income tax. You pay something called a long-term capital gains rate. So that's about 15% or 20%, depending on how much you make. So if you're in a 24% tax bracket or 35 or 37, when you earn money through investing and that amount grows, you actually save on taxes by making sure you hold on to things for greater than one year because you'll pay less tax on that than you get than you pay from working. And the last is a Roth IRA. This has been a hot topic lately. Um, a Roth IRA allows you to contribute money to a Roth IRA. You don't get any immediate tax benefit, but it grows tax free the whole time. And then when you retire, excuse me, it grows tax deferred the whole time. And when you retire, the funds come out tax free. So for example, if you put $6,000 into a Roth IRA and it becomes $80,000, you pay no tax at all on that $74,000 left, left of um, level of growth. That's why Roth IRAs are so appealing. And I recommend I recommend almost everyone having money in a Roth IRA. And the reason why, we call it tax diversification. So we know what taxes are right now. We just don't know what they're going to be five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So if you want to hedge yourself and say that, I don't know what it'll be in the future, let me put some money tax-free. So if rates do go up, I have money that's coming to me tax-free that I don't have to worry about. The others are employer plans, um, 401ks. Um, there was a question about 401k plans that are still good. Um, 401k plans are still good investments, particularly if your company offers an employer match. So most companies, they'll do something if you put in 4%, they put in 4%, and it's free money. So for example, if I put in a thousand, they put in a thousand. That's an immediate return on your investment. So for pretty much all of my clients, I tell well, all of my clients, always put up until the company match because it's free money. Anything above that we can talk about, but always put up until the company match amount because it's free money. 
403B plan and pension plans are also pretty similar. Many 403Bs offer matches. And then some pension plans, depending on how they're structured, some employers will give you money even if you don't put money in the plan as well. So this is a great opportunity that you have someone matching your money and supporting your money regardless of your investment. So it's always a great way to think about investing. So if you look here, here are the amounts that you can contribute to a IRA, traditional and Roth. So if you're under 50, you can do 6,000. If you're over 50, you can do um, 70, excuse me, 7,000. A 401k, um, for the first time in three years, they actually increased the amount you can contribute to your 401k. It went from 19,500 last year to 20,005. And if you're over 50, you can contribute 27,000. Um, and then the bottom two are more for small business owners. Those are your max amounts that you can contribute to your plan. So we talked about investing. We talked about um, diversification. And then these are the vehicles that can propel you to invest or can help you invest tax, you know, to, to generate your returns tax free or tax deferred. It's important that you talk to your CPA or financial advisor to determine what's the right vehicle for you because many of them have tax implications as well. So happy to answer some questions that we have here. Um, I can go ahead and read them to you if that's fine. Yeah, that's great. Okay. One is, I just switched employers. I was told that I should use my 401k to buy an index fund. What do you think about that? Um, that can make sense, it depends. Um, the reason why is sometimes um, sometimes what may happen um, with certain 401ks, like particularly smaller companies, the fees can be really high. So they'll recommend you to maybe take the money out and invest it into a lower cost index fund. So when you're in a 401k, for the company to contribute and match, you have to be in that 401k plan. But if you've left, you don't have to worry about that. And you can choose what funds you want, and you can reduce your costs potentially by not keeping it in that 401k. Okay, thank you. Here's another one from Facebook Live. Would you suggest waiting to invest in real estate due to it being a seller's market right now, or do more research to find better valued homes at a good price? I would say do more research to find good homes at a price, at a good price. Um, it is still a seller's market. It's starting to cool down. Um, you know, gone are the days, like last year in Atlanta, I have some friends who sold their house and had like 20 offers in two days. Um, that's not happening as much right now. Um, it's still a seller's market, but it's starting to, to die down some, particularly as interest rates increase. The only concern we say right now is that if you wait and interest rates increase, yes, you may, you know, buy the home for less, but if the interest rates are higher, you're still kind of paying the same for a while. So I would focus on, um, you know, why you're looking for a home. Um, you know, typically um, mortgages are less than rent and rents are increasing now too. So I wouldn't let the seller's market deter you for looking at about possible homes and looking at areas where there could be opportunity. Okay. What are your thoughts on cryptocurrency, Bitcoins, things like that? They're fun, but cryptocurrency is extremely volatile. Um, I think Bitcoin's down about 50% this year um, from its high. So I think it's good for those that want to, that enjoy investing, want to see how things go. Um, but it's not designed for long-term retirement investing, investing where that money is tied to a specific goal because of the extreme level of volatility. So if it's maybe I have $5,000 of play money, I want to see how this goes, that's great. But right now, we don't recommend it for any long term right now because level of volatility. Okay, so we're going to kind of go back to stocks and bonds. Um, someone asked a question based on Robinhood. Um, so what do you recommend for new investors, an app maybe to get them started? Is Robinhood good? Yeah, Robinhood can be okay. They, they're they working on adding more controls in their system. They had some issues, I think, last year. Um, you know, I'm biased. I worked at Vanguard. Vanguard is great. Um, they have pretty low minimums. 
Um, also like Acorns as well. Um, they're a good investment vehicle. And if you want to mix budgeting and investing, I would also check out Mint. So for new beginners, um, what do you suggest for them as far as investing in stocks? Um, I would talk to a financial advisor, right? And that's one thing I would say. Um, and understand like, what are you investing for? What are your goals? And what is your risk? The reason why I say that is that the market has one return, but individual investors tend to have very different returns. And the reason is because individual investors tend to freak out when markets go down. So our job is to understand your risk and understand your goals um, and make sure that if you're trying to get that 31.55% Microsoft 10 year return, that you understand the risk, you understand the volatility and you can stay resilient and invested to obtain that return. But if you're someone who has some small you know, assets and you want to just try it out, I recommend Vanguard, I think it's great. I think Fidelity is great. I think Acorns is great. Um, also another good um, account system is Betterment. Um, they, you can start off with like $100 and they can create a portfolio for you to start buying stocks and ETFs and things like that. Is it good to have more than one for one K? This is a big spender here. We have to ask this question. Um, you can have more than one 401k. A 401k is more tied to your employer. So if you've been with one company, you'll, you'll have one 401k. If you've been with five companies, you'll have five 401ks. Now, the issue with having five 401ks for most people is keeping track of the five 401ks, looking at all the statements, making sure you invest it appropriately. And what you see people do who have five 401ks, they'll take it and consolidate it and put it into one IRA. So they get one statement, they get one balance. If there's any trades they have to do, they're not going through five different 401k systems and making trades and doing all of those things. They can do all of it in one IRA. So having multiple 401ks is not bad. It's more of a reflection of you know, how many opportunities you've had and, and the, as, as, you know, in terms of employment. But the big question is, is how do you manage it appropriately? Okay. Could you talk a little bit about 529s? Yes. Um, 529 plans are college savings plans. Um, so what you can do is you can get, in the state of Georgia, a tax deduction for contributing to a 529 plan. The money grows tax deferred. And if you use it for educational purposes, the money's tax free. So if you're someone who has a child in your life, highly encourage you exploring it. And the good thing about a 529 plan is like, let's say that child doesn't go to college or does something else, you can transfer to another sibling or relative. So the money's not gone. You can just you know, keep it, it's portable. You can bring it from one child to another. Okay. Is there a specific salary or time um, that you could suggest when you should start investing in a CFP? Yes, there's no specific salary to say now I should work with a CFP professional. Um, just have most of us like myself, we all do 30 minute introductory conversations. And we'll tell you if we're the right person you should work with. Um, I'll say, you know what, here are the maybe you should focus on budgeting right now. And that's what you should be doing or saving for your first home. And then come back to me in a couple of years, right? When you have more assets for us to manage. Or I could say, you know what? Based upon your lifestyle, your savings rates, let's work now. So um, if you were to look for a financial advisor, you have my information, I'll actually put it on the slide here. But there's another organization called Quad A. I'm not sure you guys heard it before, but Quad A, is the Association of African American Financial Advisors. And you can look on their website and you can pick a financial advisor um, based upon their representative skill sets, their area. And you can have most of us have a 30 minute free intro call where we can learn more about you and talk about next steps from there. Okay, so someone wants to know, 
They need a baby step, not just a little baby step, a baby, baby step for investing. Can you give some suggestions? Mm -hmm. I would say Betterment is a great baby step platform. Um, and the reason why is you can take $50 and they'll allocate and invest it for you immediately. And one of the things that I've always seen is that to get engaged with investing, once you see your money grow, once you see that 50 go to 55 and you put in the deposit, now you're at 200 or 300 or 400, that gets you engaged to investing even more and wanting to do more. So for typically most people, just start. Start with something or anything. Um, now, of course, you know, make sure you don't have any credit card debt, pay your debt off, right? You know, make sure you have some savings for an emergency. But once you have those things cleared, um, look to start investing. Okay. Um, question comes, I've heard about a bull market versus a bear market. How can we know which market we are in and when it's time to change our investments? That's a great question. And if you knew that, you would be a billionaire. Um, so, I mean, there are some indicators that we have. I'm, I'm joking. There are some indicators, right? So we're coming out of a 10-year bull market. And by bull market, it's 10 years of positive stock market returns. It looks like we're heading into a big because your date, we're down 10%. And that's why I mentioned before about Johnson & Johnson, defensive stocks, stocks that typically aren't as volatile. So for my clients, we're moving into those stocks slowly right now. Not all of it, but a little bit more. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. You're, you are on mute. Okay. Um, so the next question is, how can we not fall into the, since you mentioned about the markets being so volatile, how can we not fall into that? Um, the person is asking, you mentioned Zoom. Mm -hmm. That was one of the, so how they're asking some suggestions about that. You mean fall into, let me see the question here. Um, what is the best way not to fall into the modality of the um, moment markets? A lot of people gravitated towards what was the sexy in the moment, mm -hmm. such as Zoom thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, two things focus on what you're investing for and not always the day-to-day the -day and week to week so for example if you're 35 years old and you're retiring in 20 years what happens today what happens tomorrow what happens ne next week will probably have little relevance in 20 years as long as you stay the course and as long as you're in a diversified portfolio, you're not in one or two stocks. So it's really important for people to think long-term. And that's why I always show long-term returns, right? Like 10%, 9%, 30 years, it was 31%, right? Or, or, 10, or 10 years was 31%. Think long-term. Don't let someone say, there's this hot stock I heard about well, let's talk about long term. How does how does it perform historically? Um, you know, is my goal long term? If this stock, you know, like Peloton, if it goes kaput, you know, will I still be able to reach my goals? Those are the questions we typically ask our clients and we ask ourselves before we, you know, build portfolios. That's a good one. As a small business owner, would you recommend the same financial advisor for both personal and business? Um, I would say as a fellow small business owner, for us, it's different, right? Um, one of the things I work with a lot of small business owners, about a third of my clients are small business owners. And the reason why is we invest so much in our business and at times our cash flow can be inconsistent that the strategies that we utilize is very different from someone that is an employee or has, you know, a consistent biweekly paycheck and has like, you know, an employer match. Like we are the employer, right? So we're doing our contribution and we're also doing the employer match. 
Um, so how you look at, you know, number one is what type of retirement plan do you do? There's about four different ones for small business owners. Um, how much do you contribute is important. And then as an employer, because you are an employer if you're a small business owner, there are additional things you can do, like profit sharing contributions, things like that, that do take some thought and some support to make sure that you're saving enough for retirement. Okay, we have time for one more question and feel free afterwards to um, just look in the chat and you can answer the rest if you have a moment. But sure. here's our last um, question, let's say live. What investment tool would you recommend for a small business owner? And should investments look different for someone who works for themselves or versus someone who works in corporate America? Yeah, so I think it's pretty similar that you really want to make sure um, as a small business owner, I'll tell you this one thing, have a great CPA. Um, that's immensely important. Um, your accountant should understand your business cash flow, your structure, and then working with an advisor that knows what kind of plans you can create and establish and how much you should be saving. One of the things that I've always seen with small business owners, we focus a lot on building our business and building it to sell or to transfer to our loved ones that we don't create the similar retirement plans that most corporate companies do. So having a CPA, having an advisor that can help say, all right, you're making this money, here are some retirement plans that can be beneficial for you now and saving money in taxes, but also build up your retirement nest egg for the future is really important. Thank you so much, Ms. Elliott. We so appreciate you. And no. hopefully you can stick around um, for a little while so you can answer some questions. I'll be happy. Are, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, that are in the chat. Um, the time is now um, a little bit after eight. We have another guest for tonight. Um, there is, should be in the chat for everyone to answer um, a few questions based on tonight's presentation. If you can take some time to look at Ms. Elliott's information and jot that down before we proceed to the next slide. Thank you so much, Sora Clark, and thank you so much, Ms. Elliott. Um, you, you have shared some um, information and your expertise, and we are especially grateful for your commitment to our audience tonight, even while you're under the weather. So <laughs> again, thank you. I encourage all of our audience members to reach out to Ms. Elliott um, to further engage and uh, receive personal uh, consultation for your specific um, situation. So again, thank you. And at this time, we will um, introduce our next presenter. Good evening. My name is Sabrina Francis, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. Valentia Adlin is the founder of the Adlin Law Group law firm where she is devoted to providing dependable service and quality legal representation. Attorney Arlene has spent 10 years as an entrepreneur managing a private practice where she focuses on primarily on estate planning and probate, bankruptcy and real estate. She advises clients on building and maintaining wealth while educating clients on how to pass down wealth and build a future for their loved ones. Whether counseling small business owners on succession planning or helping individuals with, a state, with their estate plan, Attorney Eileen has spent her legal career assisting families in building and preserving legacies for generations to come. In addition to her practice, Attorney Eileen has lectured and participated in workshops on starting and maintaining a small business, preserving and transferring family wealth, and real estate investing. Despite her caseload, Valentia is heavily involved in various legal organizations. She is the incoming president of the Georgia Association of Women Lawyers, 
advisory board member of the DeKalb Volunteer Lawyers Foundation, a volunteer for the Wills Project with the Georgia Association of Black Women Attorneys, a member of the Atlanta Bar Association, and the American Academy of Estate Planning Attorneys. Outside of the legal profession, Valentia spends her time working with the ABLE Group, a nonprofit that she co-founded that provides advisory services on financial wellness and wealth building along with donating a significant amount of her time to Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, where she serves on the executive committee of the Atlanta Suburban Alumni Chapter. Valentia obtained a Juris Doctorate degree from Loyola University Chicago School of Law, a master's degree of laws in taxation from Northwestern University School of Law, a master's in business administration from the University of Phoenix and her bachelor's of arts from the University of Virginia. Prior to practicing law, she was a residential and real estate agent and commercial real estate agent in her early career and then transitioned to marketing and business development in the corporate sector for over 15 years. She is an avid sports fan, a music enthusiast, and also enjoys spending time traveling the world, having visited 53 countries. Without further ado, I present our next speaker, Valentia Eileen. Thank you so much, Serena. Hopefully you all can hear me. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you all this evening. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, I think that uh, Camila did an amazing job and um, it, this will tie in very nicely because, you know, what she focused on, of course, it's important to um, build wealth and pass on a legacy to your family, but my job is to protect it. So these will go hand in hand and let's just get started here. So who needs an estate plan? That's that's always the question I, I get from everyone. And, and the simple answer is everyone. Um, it's not just for the older generations. In fact, almost everyone should have basic documents in place um, because, and these include, which we'll talk about wills, power of attorneys and, and healthcare directives um, because we're building for wealth planning, but you know, when we talk about wills and trust, uh, wills are certainly only relevant, God forbid, when you leave this earth. And so we want to plan for that. But there's important measures that we should be taking while we're still here. Um, God forbid, if something happens to us and we need someone to manage our affairs where, when and if we can't. Um, so um, we'll talk about that. And um, this is, you know, when we talk about trust, which will tie in greatly with what Camila talked about, you know, I always look at estate planning as building blocks. As you build your wealth, um, you should be building a more sophisticated estate plan because where you start today is not where you're going to end tomorrow. And so as we get sophisticated in um, accumulating assets and wealth, so should be um, our estate planning because there are different tools based on where you are in that journey. So um, most important thing is, like I said, is to start somewhere. I, I am a big proponent, especially, you know, unfortunately in the African-American community, uh, specifically, everyone th thinks that this is just for people with wealth. I tell people all the time, it's not about wealth, it's about your wishes and your wishes being respected. And so it's never too early and it's certainly never too late to be thinking it's not I certainly want to encourage you, and that's what the series is about, right, is how we um, accumulate wealth and how we pass it along. But it's just as important that everything that you have still matters, and we want to make sure that we are carrying out your wishes um, and leaving that legacy for your family. So, um, like I said, most important thing is to have a, a state plan in place, because what we're also going to talk about this evening is what happens when you don't. I'm a big, just like, I don't like the IRS in my pockets. Um, I don't like the courts in my pockets, ironically enough, and that sounds weird for, for an attorney to say that, but 
I am a big proponent of you having control over what you want seen done with your assets. So what does proper estate planning do as we talk about transferring wealth, right? You've done this amazing job um, with accumulating it, whether it's through 401ks, whether it's through real estate investing, how do we put all this together? Um, and what a proper estate plan, as you can see, um, hopefully on the screen, it's about you having a voice in what we do in the future with your assets and how you leave them behind. So if you've got all the tools in the toolbox, and we're going to talk about what that means, is if the proper, I call it your team, your team is your toolbox, you know, whether it's someone like Camila, who's financial advisor to a CPA, we all have different specialties and we all have a role to play. And so, and this is why I said there's pieces that are interrelated and we work together because I certainly can draft your documents, but one of the first things I tell clients is you wanna have <laughs> your CPA on speed dial, right? Because it's also about minimize, as we grow that wealth, we wanna minimize that tax liability um, so that um, your estate is not hit with a significant amount of estate tax, right? So if we're talking about this, um, one of the main things as you grow into your wealth journey is going to be trying to avoid probate. And I'm gonna tell you about why I'm a big advocate um, as you accumulate, if you can avoid probate as much as possible. Again, it's also about maintaining control over your assets in, in your affairs. And if you, I always say, you know, unfortunately tomorrow is never promised. So, you know, hopefully we're here for a long time, but what if we have children? and how do we protect those minors? Because as you have this wealth, they're not going, you know, whether it's a life insurance policy, whether they're the uh, beneficiaries of a 401k or other retirement vehicle, you're not able to leave that directly to a minor, right? They're just not capable of handling that type of wealth. So we're making sure we're putting things in place that, <clears throat> excuse me, protects not only that wealth, but manage it so that when the children are old enough to be able to handle that on their own is being um, nurtured and protected while someone's working on their behalf. And that's when we start talking about trustees and guardianship. And um, like I said, a big thing about what I talk to people is avoiding um, estate tax, because a lot of people don't realize estate tax is the largest tax, I believe it's almost at 50%. And so it can significantly, you work so hard to generate this wealth to pass down to your loved ones, but we didn't do the proper planning. Um, and now they're hit with a huge estate tax bill if we don't plan properly. Um, so again, if you don't plan, the biggest thing, now you're letting the courts decide what to do for you um, with what you have worked so hard um, in your life to accumulate. Um, and also legislation can change, right? Um, and so not knowing who ends up with your assets. So all these are very important. And I, as an estate plan attorney, I mean, just one, like I said earlier, one piece of the pie, mm -hmm. one part of your toolkit. So what does an estate plan include? <clears throat> and this is, I'm gonna approach this from a ladder up perspective because you know, those who are on this webinar, I can almost guarantee you, if you talk to the next person, you're probably at different journeys um, when it comes to your wealth building. So when you look at it overall, when a estate plan includes is a will. And if there's a trust, you're gonna have what we call a portable will a revocable living trust, um, which we'll talk about, advanced healthcare directive and a durable power of attorney. Now, what you see on the right side of the screen, as we are, this is really more if you have a trust. And so you'll have additional documents that you wanna have in place, um, which include your certification of trust, um, how you want to distribute your personal property, very important, um, retitling the assets, which I will tell you what that means um, shortly. And again, as we talked about, if you do have minors um, or you're taking care of elderly, um, how do we have that conservatorship or guardianship um, 
written down and covered so that again unfortunately if you are unable to um, handle this that we have it clearly documented who should be stepping in your place and then finally which i will take a pause here when you talk about life insurance and retirement plans if you talk to an estate planning attorney <clears throat> excuse me um that is what we call non-probate assets and what that means is even if I put something in your estate planning documents, um, if it's a beneficiary form, which is going to be an annuity, life insurance, 401ks, IRAs, the beneficiary form is going to trump whatever I have created in your documents. So it's very important to understand that. Um, and it actually just um, came up with a client. Um, their loved one um, had gotten all these insurance policies, but never took the time to actually complete the beneficiary designation form. And so <clears throat> then we got into intestine, what we call intestate, which means when you pass with um, out of will, um, <laughs> the client said she's probably rolling over her grave because she didn't do the beneficiary form. We had to look at the rules of intestacy here in Georgia and the assets were she didn't have any children so the assets then went to the next layer because her parents were already um, deceased so then the next in line is if you um, have any children and, and she wasn't married and if they're not then it actually goes to your um, siblings and she had a unfortunately a very uh, fractionally divided uh, relationship with her siblings so why am i mentioning this um if we're going to take the time to create wealth let's not sell ourselves short by not doing the next step by planning uh, my favorite phrase is spend a little money on the front end so you can save thousands of dollars on the back end by doing proper planning now when we start talking about a will or a trust right um a will is to have a valid will, everyone thinks you need this sophisticated instrument. Now, of course, as an estate plan attorney, I'm going to say you should always consult with an attorney. Um, but even if you can't right now, it should always eventually, again, if we're talking about wealth building, eventually you will be able to, um, if you're not in a position now, to be able to consult with an attorney is really important um, because we want to just make sure we're in compliance with um, Georgia code and statute. But the simple, if you were to do this on your own, because again, I'm more of a proponent of you having something versus nothing. Um, to have a valid will, you've got to have, you have to be of capacity, which means you're over the age of 18. It has to have two witnesses um, and they have to be able to uh, state that you were of your sound mind and body when they witness. And, and the second witness, a lot of people think you need three people. Um, a witness is an independent person. It shouldn't be someone who's a beneficiary of whatever you're writing in your will. But the second witness actually is the notary public um, because you should have, in order to also have a valid will, it needs to be notarized. So your, your basic construct of your will would be meeting the age um, capacity um, requirement you name an executor and who do you want benefiting or basically receiving you know your assets um what you want to leave behind to whoever these beneficiaries are um and again if there's minors this is where you would say who should be taking care of your your children um if unfortunately you are no longer able to the biggest thing that we're going to talk about is when you have a will you're going to go through probate which I, I will get into a little bit deeper um, shortly. Now, that's a simple will. A trust um, is actually, and a will is only relevant, like I said, when you pass, but a trust is a living, breathing document that we, as we are building our wealth, we're having this trust to be able to put our assets in, in order to avoid the biggest thing, which to me is avoiding probate. And if there's anyone who's been who's on here who's been through the probate process, um, it is I call it the thankless job. Um, it's it, you're holding first of all, you're saying that you will uphold your fiduciary duty to convey and 
roll out what your loved one or whoever's asked you to be an executor to do when they're unable to, right? Um, and so there's there's a lot of responsibility, whether you're an executor on a will or you're a trustee of a trust. As I said before, with the difference between a will is it really only basically is um, opened up when you pass versus a trust. If you have a revocable living trust, we're actually putting assets into that trust while you're living. So what that means is without being too complex, most people that I deal with are going to have revocable trust, which means during my lifetime, I can be the trustee of my own trust. I can manage what goes in, what goes out. I can invest. Basically all the control is under my name versus there is a different type of trust. <clears throat> and there's several trusts, but most people think about when you hear the word living will, they're just talking about it a revocable trust versus an irrevocable is when you start talking about high net worth clients, which, you know, Camila was referring to a little bit earlier. We do our irrevocable trust, which means you take yourself out of that trustee and there's a third party, independent third party who manages the assets in the trust. And the main reason why you would do that is when you start accumulating a lot of wealth and now it's a tax strategy is to move that taxable income out of your estate. And therefore, again, when you're leaving this wealth to your loved ones, they're not hit with a significant um, estate tax consequence. So that's the big difference between a revocable and an irrevocable trust. Um, there's things that's called islets. Uh, most people won't get to a need. Um, if, if you do, I'm available um to be a beneficiary but most people won't get or need an irrevocable trust because when congress passed in 2000 uh, i think it was 2011 they re um de de defined the limits um and so back in the earlier 2000s folks like myself had to do more sophisticated tax planning because we were trying to minimize the taxation of the trust. But now if you're an individual, um, you don't even look at a state tax um, until it's 10 million, um, the net worth. And if it's a couple, it's up to 20 plus million. So most people won't reach that capacity. But if you, there are, that's again, as we grow in our wealth, we should be growing um, with our state planning attorney our CPAs, our financial advisors, and working as a unit to make sure we are looking at keeping money in your pocket as much as possible to give to your loved ones versus and let it ultimately the IRS um, take a big chunk when you ultimately pass away and wish to distribute these um, assets to your loved ones. This most second and probably most important thing I'll say regarding the trust as well, trust is only good if it's funded. Um, and what we mean by that, you know, you have people who go in and create these wonderful documents, but then they never fund the trust. And so we're basically, if the person passes away, we're back to as though you basically had a will because, um, which I'll get into for a asset to be removed from your estate, we've got to retitle it, meaning we've got to rename it and convey the interest in the trust and take it out of your name. Otherwise, you're going to be going right back to probate as though if you just had a will. So I just wanted to kind of give a quick high level overview of what a simple will is compared to a trust. And they do go hand in hand. Eventually, as I said, as you start to grow in your your estate planning and your wealth building, a will, a will becomes less relevant and a trust becomes a huge part of protecting that wealth to leave to your, to your loved ones. The next thing you have in your state plan, and so as I said, a, a will is relevant only unfortunately when you pass away. A trust, I can be <clears throat> putting things in a trust, but again, when we talk about distribution to your loved ones, that's only gonna happen again when you pass away. And we want the trustee now to administer out to your heirs what you actually have put in the trust. So those two instruments are more about um, legacy planning for when you leave this earth and live, leave this wealth to your, to your loved ones, to your family. These next two things that I'm talking about are relevant right now. 
And I, it's a simple phrase. Um, you've many of you've heard tomorrow's never promised for any of us. Right. So, um, you know, you could go out <clears throat> and get in a car accident and now you're, you know, incapacitated. And so a durable power of attorney, and we're going to talk about the advanced healthcare directive in a second is relevant right now. So basically what this is, is if you're not in the position to speak for yourself, because either you're um, incapacitated, um, you could be in a coma, um, or you're deemed incompetent, you could develop Alzheimer's or dementia, who do you trust to manage your financial affairs if you cannot do it for yourself? And a durable power of attorney, it can be as broad in scope or narrow in scope. You may only have a durable power of attorney, you're overseas and you need someone to sign real estate documents for you. So it can be general or it can be very narrow, basically transaction by transaction. But the, the general premise behind a durable power of attorney is someone is acting as your attorney in fact and they are acting on your behalf um, if they are unable to uh, for whatever reason. Um, this also is can be either immediate or what we call a springing power. And what, when you hear the term springing power, that's again, maybe you say in your power of attorney, you do not want this to kick in um, until a doctor says that I'm incapacitated or, you know, uh, obviously if you're in a coma or something like that. Um, so it doesn't have to be immediate. It can be a springing power where an act has to occur in order for the person that you've asked to be your attorney in fact to actually take on that role. And the last thing I'll say about this is that, um, again, this is for very important if you have assets that you did not put in place um, in your trust. The second power of attorney, you'll hear people say healthcare power of attorney here in Georgia, we actually call it an advanced healthcare directive. And it's the same thing as the durable power of attorney, except it's only related to medical. And um, this is very personal for me um, as um, I lost uh, both my parents within the, la the last 13 months. And I had to have um, power of attorneys for, for both of them. Um, with my mother, she had stage four cancer, didn't find out until a month before she passed away. But um, the Fortunately, for what I do, I knew as my parents were starting to become elderly, how important these power of attorneys were. Um, it really became relevant because when my mother passed away, um, it was right in the kind of beginnings of COVID. And at that time, they weren't letting anyone into the hospital. And, and you think about, we do all this legacy planning and she did everything right. In my wildest dreams, I never would have thought that you know, I wouldn't be able to see her unless I had this power of attorney because those were the only people they at the time were letting into the hospital um, to be able to see a loved one. And so I share that because yes, this is about protecting wealth, but this is also thinking bigger picture that you just never know what curveballs you might be thrown. And if your loved one becomes sick or is in the final stage of their life, the last thing I want to be worrying about um, is did we get their health care power of attorney taken care of in those final weeks or days or months, I want to be focusing on just remembering that loved one. So I can't stress because it, it happened to me personally, the importance of having an advanced health care power of attorney, and it can be a hard conversation, I only need to have it once. But, you know, it's important to know, did that person um, want, you know, to have be on a feeding tube or want, you know, uh, CPR, or, you know, wants to be cremated or, um, you know, wants a burial. Um, and there can hard questions. But again, I guess because I see this on a daily basis, I'm all about minimizing family drama. So. If I know what your wishes are, I may not like them, but I'm going to respect them because you told me what it was before the end of life. Um, and so uh, this is not to make this a morbid conversation, but it's, it's irrelevant, especially in the times that we're living in right now, um, that this is these two documents I actually draft more 
in the last two years in versus in the first 15 years of my practice because of um, pandemic, which were completely out of our control. So again, healthcare directive, whether it's the advanced healthcare directive, which is only specifically about making medical decisions um, for someone if they can't make them themselves, and the durable power of attorney if you need to make financial decisions, these are relevant while you are alive versus the will and trust really take place or going to kick into play when you pass away. Now, the question I get all the time is, you know, do I need a will? Do I need a trust? Um, they're both effectively transferring your assets um, to your beneficiaries and they actually interplay with each other. Understanding how they work together is key, is the key to knowing what you need to do and which one's going to make the most sense for you. Um, so there is, I will debunk the myth right now, there is not a right or wrong answer. Um, and but the biggest thing is I do have some suggestions on when I would encourage you to um, get a trust uh, versus uh, a will, which we'll talk about in a minute, but I can't stress enough. All I really care about um, is, again, as we talk about this series, if we're working so hard to build a legacy and, and to become successful entrepreneurs, let's not short change and not think about this part of the process because um, you know, I always think about when big famous stars pass away and, you know, you, you, like, how did they not have an estate plan? You're worth millions. And they had divorce attorneys in place. They have CPAs in place, but somehow they didn't get the memo that they should have a discussion with an estate plan attorney. And so I say that it, this is not, again, about those who are rich and those who aren't. I think a lot of this because people just don't want to talk about in you know mortality and so we kind of push this conversation to the side but you you are doing yourself and your loved ones a disservice if we're not taking this final step by making sure we have these in place so the similarities are that um, both vehicles, whichever one you choose, um, provide for distributing property um, at your death to your loved ones um, and neither have an adverse income tax consequence. Um, so that's great. That's the similarities. Again, um, I'm gonna talk about the probate process because I wanna start if you are just at the beginning and I think that's always a question, well, where do I begin? I wanna at least talk about the basics of what happens if you do go through the probate process. So if it, the if you need a trust, then um, these are the suggestions I have if you are going to have a trust versus a will. The first being that if you own real estate, which I know Camila talked about as well, I encourage you to have a trust. Um, if you have total net worth or assets over $150,000, have a trust. Um, again, if you want to spare the burden and the cost of probate, I got a theme going if you guys can't tell, have a trust. Um, and certainly if you have minors, have a trust. Why are all of these things important? That very last thing you'll see individuals with large estate task, tax risk. So if I look at a trust compared to a will, <clears throat> again, let's say, as Camila talked about, one of the investment strategies is, um, and I'm a big, I'm a real estate investor as well. Um, that is how, because I'm self-employed, I don't have a 401k, you know, when I left, corporate America, there went my my 401k from an employer. So I don't have an employer match, you know, to match what I would be putting in a traditional 401k. So that was out the window when I went on my own, you know, 10 plus years ago. But I knew I wasn't in the position to retire. So what did I, where was I going to accumulate my wealth? How was I going to start it? Um, because lawyering is being lawyer lawyering is great, um, but let me debunk the second myth: not every attorney um, are 
gazillionaires. Um, I'm not a litigator. I'm what we call a transactional attorney, means I'm dealing with paper all day. So my practice is volume-based versus a litigator um, could have one case that matches what I do in a month. So I share that is when you're, whatever your profession is, um, hairstylist, um, you know, real estate investor, whatever the case may be, you need to be thinking about where my portfolio is going to consist of. And for me, um, because I come from a real estate background before becoming an attorney as well, it made a natural fit for me. So why is this relevant to a trust? If I never retitled, so there's three things. First one is that I'm trying to protect my asset. It's an asset protection tool. That's what a trust, that's one of the biggest benefits because um, a creditor can get to me, but they can't get to what's in my trust. So I'm retitling that asset because I'm um, avoiding creditor risk. I'm also avoiding, you know, especially with owning real estate, someone could slip and fall at your property. Now they're coming to see what they can get from you to sue you. Um, you can't get to me again if I have my properties in a trust um, or LLC. So you want to make sure, and this is why I'm going to sound like a broken record. Everyone that you've heard from this week and, and last week, we are all tools in your toolbox. And so um, that trust is important because it keeps me judgment proof um, and I'm protecting what most people, real estate is going to be your biggest asset. So you're you're trying to create tools to protect it. Um, please go back. And so um, the second thing is that <clears throat> with a real estate, if I buy all this property, but I never retile the asset, again, I created this wonderful, sophisticated trust, but I didn't retitle it. And so, and when we say retitling, it's typically, if you've heard the term quick claim deed, I've got to transfer ownership interest out of my name and put it into the trust. Because if I don't, you defeat the purpose of the trust. Um, your, your loved ones are going to have to go back to probate because legally no one has the ability to sell, rent the property, whatever, until it goes through a judge who says, yes, I will grant you the powers to be the administrator or the executor, and you can do what you see fit with the property. That's another reason why I like trust. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm probably the cynical attorney, but I, I try to keep courts out of my life as much as possible. So it's important to, um, if that's your goal, then um, make sure you have the trust so that I can avoid a judge telling me what and when and how I can do with my real estate. Um, and again, if if you have minor children, um, and let's say you've amassed a large portfolio of real estate, <clears throat> which is great, um, they're too young, and you don't want them potentially inheriting, you know, a three million dollar portfolio at eighteen years old and don't know what to do with it. So, what a trust does compared to a will it puts parameters in place. So maybe you give your children a third of their inheritance at age 25 and another third at 30 and then the remainder at 35, whatever you see fit. What a trust really is important is it gives you that flexibility to put parameters in place to not only protect the wealth that you've generated, but also um, give some um, stability um, so that your loved ones um, don't blow through their inheritance. So it's just a great planning tool, again, for you to keep that control because you know your, ch especially if you have children, you know them best and when and when they can handle that type of financial responsibility. Now, as I just said earlier, um, when we say retitling the asset, um, we are talking about typically a quick claim deed or I can assign property um, because again, if you don't, you're going to go through probate. What I was alluding to earlier, when you see beneficiary de designation, the reason I put this here is again, whether you have a will or you have a trust, if you have anything that has a beneficiary designation, that is going to be non-probate. And that means I don't need the court permission to do anything. I call the administrator and um, advise of my loved one's passing and the neighbors pull out to see who's on the beneficiary form and they distribute whatever those funds are. 
Now, why do I have this on this slide though? Again, you might have minor children. So if I'm creating the trust <clears throat> and I have minor children, or maybe I have a special needs child who will never be able to you know, be on their own, that trust is gonna be the beneficiary because I need someone to have a fiduciary role who is capable of understanding this wealth and not blow it. And so they're only administering those funds for your child's welfare, meaning their health and their education until they reach a certain age. Or like I said, if it's um, uh, a special needs child or someone who won't have the capabilities of managing their financial affairs by naming the trust as either a main beneficiary or, or contingent beneficiary, it puts the trustee back in place to manage those finances and financials until your loved ones are capable of doing it on their own. So do want to um, give a word of, of caution. Um, and this is why I said a trust, you know, it's relevant. Your estate planning documents should always be reviewed every three to five years because again, what we're drafting today could be significantly different five years from now. You know, your children are now over 25 and they don't need a trust. They can manage their stuff on their own. But the reason why I put this here, it's very important. Um, if you're talking about retirement plans, and this is when I said you, I'm not gonna be a CPA, I'm, I'm not a licensed uh, CPA, but this is something you wanna consult with your CPA on because um, there are um, some consequences um, if you have a trust. Um, naming a trust as a beneficiary, again, is advantageous if you have minors or children or family members with disabilities. The primary disadvantage of naming a trust as a beneficiary of a retirement plan is it's subject to what we call RMD payouts or required minimum distribution, which is calculated based on the life expectancy of the oldest beneficiary. So let's say you had five children. Um, it's going to be based in when and they and maybe they don't want to pull the funds out but they require because of based on the oldest child's age and they're having to um pull from it when they really didn't need to and then they're also going to face tax consequences right because that's extra income coming into their income for the year if it's only one beneficiary it's not really an issue or problematic um but i did want to point that out that there are sometimes it does not make sense for the trust to be the beneficiary versus an individual. But these are the conversations that um, you have with your estate plan attorney. We will look at your situation, where you are now and where you wanna be, and we start planning accordingly so that your estate planning documents are always to the best of our ability in alignment as you grow um, in age, as you grow in wealth, and we're starting to think about transitioning that wealth onto your heirs. So um, hopefully what you all got out of this is there were four things I really wanted to highlight, which were um, what documents are actually in the estate plan, um, learning how the documents work together, how to um, avoid probate, um, which I'm a big fan of. And, and I'll, I'll say this, the reason why I stressed if, if you don't wanna do probate, <clears throat> let's say a will might, you know, if it's a simple will, it might cost you six, seven hundred dollars. Okay, um, a trust. Uh, when I do someone's trust, typically it's around it's a couple thousand dollars to do the trust. If you have to go through probate, so you're like, okay, I'll do the will because it's only a couple hundred dollars on the front end. Well, if you call my office for probate, it's a five thousand dollar retainer. So this is one of the reasons why I said, as you grow in your wealth, you may not need a trust now, but you're spending a little money on the front end to save thousands on the back end because probate can be costly, especially if someone wants to um, dispute <laughs> what you're leaving behind. And so litigation costs can run up. There's publication costs because you've got to run legal advertising, notice of creditors, so on and so forth. So it's just something to think about um, of why trust, especially since this theme is around wealth building, as you build your wealth, you're going to want to ultimately transition into having a trust over just having a simple will.
And like I said, learn how to use trust to keep the courts out of your business. Um, and you can do what you see fit with your, um, your assets that you leave behind to your family and your loved ones. Um, so that's it for me. I'll turn this over for, for questions. Um, I, I'll leave my contact information there, but hopefully you all were able to get some good nuggets. Yes, we got some great questions. So one of the first questions is any recommendations regarding special needs, trust, and will? Yes, that's a good, great question. Um, if there are special needs, you have a special needs child, you're going to want to talk to an estate plan attorney because if you're leaving them wealth, what you don't want to do is jeopardize their social security benefits. And so that's, there's, that's an actual special trust. It's an, it's called a special needs trust. And um, that has to be designed and drafted so that it doesn't violate any benefits that they're currently receiving from the government. So if that's something you need, then you want to make sure um, you're telling your state plan attorney that you need. And I do special needs trust a, a lot, but that is a sophisticated trust compared to a simple living trust that you want someone who knows how the Social Security Administration works so that we don't jeopardize the benefits that your special needs um, child or person caring for is receiving and so it goes hand in hand. you can have a simple will but if you're trying to leave funds or basically inheritance for your child you need or a loved one who has special needs you need a special needs trust um, in addition to the will okay can a trust and a will be combined into one document no so they are two distinctive things um, a a will is hence why I said you might take baby steps in that um, the will might you might start off with and then as you grow in your your wealth and we need to actually have the trust the simple will goes away and that's what you all remember is what I call a pour over will. And you need that because if I only have a will, I'm going through probate. But with a pour over, it's a shortened version. I call it a mini will. And it tells the probate court, because you still have to file when the person deceased to let the world know that they are now passed. But what the pour over will simply says, hey, Mr. Court, I have a trust. And can you let me go on about my business and handle what's in the trust? So you, they, you do need a will, but it's actually called a pour over. And it's a simple, simple, small will that instructs the courts that there's a trust that's out there and I don't need to be under the, the probate court's thumb to execute whatever was in the trust. Earlier, you made a statement um, and we just wanted some clarification on it. Can you share what you meant again about having a trust without funding is no good? Yes. So to be clear, if I draft a trust for you and you tell me, um, so Holly, you have um, 10 properties and we did this wonderful document but we never retitled the asset from holly reed over to the reed trust or whatever the name of your trust is it is you just pay me money just to draft something fancy because legally i haven't transferred ownership from my individual i still may have debt you know the note stays in your name but the what we call the title or the ownership interest has not been transferred over to the trust and therefore no one legally has the authority until a probate judge says you can to do anything with that asset. So it is very important that that attorney who's drafting your documents, you should have a warranty deed or a quick claim deed that says from Holly to XYZ trust. And then that, that quick claim or warranty deed gets recorded in your county's deed and records office that shows that title has been transferred over to the trust. Otherwise, when you pass, we're going right back to probate. Now, are there any tax implications? So using that example, when you're retitling that asset um, to those in the trust to move it into the trust? There are no tax consequences. All we're talking about um, is just ownership, right? And so, and actually, it's a good question. So if I won't, I'll put my little LM, LLM hat on for a second and I guess that's what I paid all that money for to get it. So when a child or whoever you're leaving behind inherits it, 
they get what we call a stepped up basis. It's not a cost basis. So if Holly left me, let's pretend she was my mom, which she's too young and cool to be, but I was a little bit younger and she left me her property. Um, I, and she bought it for a hundred thousand, but it's now worth 200,000 and I go to sell it for 300. Um, if you guys remember Camila talking about capital gains, the tax I'm looking at 200,000 because when I inherited it, that was the value because it's, you get the benefit as the beneficiary of getting a stepped up basis. And so the gain is only a hundred thousand versus if you go to sell it, um, Holly yourself, your basis is hundred thousand, which you bought it for. And when you sold it for 300, now you've got um, a capital gains of 200,000. So there's not a tax consequence when you transfer. It has nothing to do with taxation. It has honestly more to do with avoiding probate when you are retitling your assets. Um, and whether I have the property in a trust or I never get a chance to get to it and I only and you we're going through probate, again, whoever receives or inherits that probably still is going to get the stepped up basis. The IRS does not penalize the inheritor, inheritee, excuse me, um, for taking on, especially let's say it was your childhood home and your parents bought it at 50000 and now it's worth 600000 That's a huge tax consequence, but the IRS does not penalize the person receiving it. Um, they get a stepped up basis. Now, is there a minimum amount, annual amount needed to fund it for us? No, I tell clients, um, you could, I'm, I'm cheap. So I'm like, okay, what I need you to do is find a checking account. Mine is with Fidelity. Um, that does not charge me any banking fees. And I put $10. When I say fund, I just need you to have an account because if you don't, when that person receives the um, inheritance, um, then um, they're going to have to go and get a tax ID number and open it. Because again, um, I didn't do the final step and, <laughs> and, and fund the trust. So there's no checking account that's open. And so when the estate gets a check, you know, for $200,000, it realizes no one can cash it because an, an account was never opened. So I tell people, open up a free checking account, whatever the minimum is, most banks, I think the minimum is $100 and just keep it there. That is literally the basics of funding. If you're talking about liquid cash, if you're talking about real estate, and again, I need you to, if you create this trust and we want to now make sure we avoid probate, then I need you to, that's when that quick claim or warranty deed kicks in and we need to retitle that asset. But pure cash, stocks, whatever, just open up a simple brokerage account that has the name of the trust and we can pour any proceeds in there so your loved ones don't have to do that. Which also reminds me, um, if for some reason you never get to a trust, um, but you still want to avoid probate. Maybe you don't own property, but you had money in the bank. I always encourage clients, um, you know, parents are like, I don't want my child on my checking account. That's fine, but at least do a POD or a pay on death benefit so that when you pass away, again, um, your child doesn't have to go to probate just to get into the checking account. You've already put them as a pay on death beneficiary so that they can receive whatever that liquid cash is in your um you know, your financial accounts. Awesome. Wonderful. We have a few questions on power of attorney. Do you have to have a power of attorney if you are married? No one ever has to have a power of attorney. I just encourage, and if you do have a power of attorney, your spouse doesn't have to be your POA. Um, you may love them, but you, your husband is awful at finances and you wouldn't trust him managing your checkbook if you couldn't. Maybe your child is the financial power of attorney, but you trust your husband to make your health care decisions. So you make him your health care power of attorney. The most important thing about estate planning, it's whatever your wish is. Your husband might be offended. That's not my that's not my role in this 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 game. My role is to simply tell you, hey, this is why you need a power of attorney. And whoever you decide to be your agent, it's still your choice, whether you're married or not. And um have an honest conversation. Um, you know, I hate to say it, spouses have burned each other too. Like you didn't know that your husband or wife didn't know how to manage money. And now you're, you know, 
they put you in a worse position. So I can love you, but that doesn't mean I need you managing my, my finances. And um, hopefully that doesn't happen, but does it happen? Absolutely. I have plenty of clients who do not have their spouses as their power of attorneys. And again, my job is simply to draft and respect their wishes, but you don't have to have a power attorney. I just gave you the benefits for why you should. And if you are married, your spouse doesn't necessarily have to be your, your agent or your attorney in fact. But in most cases, they are. Now, if you get a, can you get an advanced healthcare power of attorney if a loved one is already in the hospital and rehabilitating, but not fully capable of filling out forms, or is it too late at that point? That's a great question. Um, power of attorneys are all about capacity. Um, if and I take that very seriously because I, I don't want. I work too hard for my license. I'm not jeopardizing it because you want me to go see cousin Ray Ray and just sign. No, I'm not doing that. So, but it's a capacity question. You may be sick, but I ask cognitive questions. What day of the, of the year it is? When were you born? If you can show me that you still have competency to make your decisions, you're just ill, um, then absolutely. I've unfortunately had to go to hospitals and do power of attorneys. Um, so it's not about the the health condition, but about the mental state, because that's what could be questioned if that loved one dies and their daughter says, my, you know, his, his, you know, my stepmom coerced him and I know he wasn't of his right mind. He couldn't even tell me how old he was or when he was born. So it's a capacity issue, not necessarily a conditional issue. Um, if they are already incompetent, that's when you're, you're a little too late. And this is why we're having this discussion. Do this. I can't stress it enough. Do it while you're not in that state, if at all possible. But if they've been, you know, they already have been um, diagnosed with dementia and you know they are not of the right state of mind, you can still get them to sign it, but you just need to be aware someone might come behind you and question they were not in the right mind when they signed these documents. And you need to be prepared um, for potential litigation, you know, when that loved one passes away. And that's when you see when there's a lot of money on the line, you know, in families, that's when everyone comes out of the woodwork saying daddy would have never done this and it becomes a nightmare. So that's why, if at all possible, we're talking about it while we're young and we're not in these dire situations where we're having to make really quick last minute decisions. Wonderful, here's another clarifying question. So earlier you were saying that instead of naming a beneficiary in a life insurance policy, you can name the trust, mm -hmm. Mark. If that is the case, how does that regarding get the policy money? So when you go and fill out your form, and they send you a designation form, it'll say who's your first, who's a contingent if that first person's not there. And so you put the, the trust. Um, and if it's named the, you know, the, the, the Holly Reed Trust, I know there's a trustee out there. And now that the trust has told me what I want to do with the, So the, the, the beneficiaries of my trust are my two children, right? I'm just making this up. And um, I don't trust them to um, manage, or I shouldn't even say trust. When I got my insurance policy, they were only five. So I need, you know, what happens a lot is people put their mamas and their daddies or whoever on the policies. And I tell people all the time, hopefully your family wouldn't do this, but I have seen it all. And when you put that person's name on the policy, you're saying this money is yours. Even though you know your intention was for them to, use it to take care of your children, you cannot dictate to the person who's the beneficiary what to do with that money. Now, karma might come back around, but legally, you can't tell them what to do with it. So this is what I mean by we should be checking our documents every at least five to seven years because maybe the child is now, instead of 18, they're 25 and you trust them to do things. And you don't need the trust to be the contingent beneficiary anymore. But if they're minors, they're incapacitated, whatever the case may be, then what that does is if if the read trust is the beneficiary, then we go back to the trust document that you've had me draft and it tells you what to do with those proceeds. Give them the money at 30, give it to them at 35. Um, until they reach that age, they, they have to ask your permission if they wanna use it to buy a car, buy a house. So, but basically what it does, it makes the trustee be the protector of that asset so that when you give your children or whoever the loved one is full access, it's not blown away. 
Okay. So um, when you have a mortgage, meaning you still are paying on the house, it's not yours yet. That's right. You still put that mortgage into your trust. So there's two different things. A mortgage is a debt instrument or what we call here in Georgia, a note. The actual instrument that shows title is a security deed. And the security deed says Chase Bank is the lien holder, but Valentia or Holly still owns the property. So the debt stays in your name, right? The, 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 the liability is still in Valentia Allen's or Holly Reed's name. That doesn't change. <clears throat> but the actual title interest now belongs to the trust. So um, because a, a lender is not gonna lend unless you are buku, you know, wealthy, they're not going to lend to a trust. They're going to lend to individuals. So, so that's why the debt instrument or the note still stays in your name individually. We're just talking about title because I'm not suing Chase Bank on the mortgage. I'm suing whoever has title or ownership interest in the property which would be me individually. And I'm trying to remove myself from liability. So I'm retitling that property to the trust to protect me a little bit. Give me that insulation from judgment, creditors, lawsuits, things of that nature. Um, I'll say this before I almost forgot. This is what I mean by plan as well, because I've seen this where your loved one gets sick and you know you need to put them in a nursing home. Um, this is why you should have long-term care Ideally, you know, we start talking about long term care insurance when someone turns 50 so that when our if a loved one gets gets sick, they can still stay in their home and have a nurse come to them. But let's say you didn't do that and you want to hurry up and transfer the property over to to your brother, your sister, um, because you don't want the nursing home to get at your home. Well, unfortunately, in Georgia specifically, and every state has different look back rules. But in Georgia, we have a five year look back rule, which means I'm sick. I'm transferring my property to Holly. Maybe I last a year, maybe two years in a nursing home and then I pass away. Well, when you fill out that form, it says, did you transfer any assets to anybody before you got here? Everyone knows social security goes away. You know, they take that, but they all, they don't realize they're coming for your real estate too. So in Georgia, I have five years to rewind that, unwind that transaction. I can go up back to five years and make you give me that asset because what people don't realize nursing homes are nothing but interest-free loans the average cost of a nursing home per month i think is now around seven thousand a month and let's say you only get a two thousand dollar social security check well you're coming up five thousand dollars short every month so if we let's say that loved one lasted for 12 months that's sixty thousand dollars i didn't get paid they're looking to see if you had any asset transfers because they're coming back for that house. So it's very important. Um, I hope I don't sound too morbid, but it's really important to have these conversations. And I always, when someone comes into my office, if they're 50 years old, that's the first thing I'm asking is, do we have some long-term care insurance? Because that's how it protects you. You're paying that so that you can be taken care of in your home and you're not really exposing yourself to a, a nursing home that could take that asset that you worked so hard to pass down to your children. So I did want to point that out that Georgia specifically has a five year look back rule um, and um, you can try to lie on the form, but all they got to do is go to Dean Records, do a search on your name and see that you actually did transfer that property to somebody mm, mm, and mm. they're looking for them and they will come and collect and take that home back. So that's really important. Okay. Um, is it, what would be the cost to revise the trust after it has been granted? A good question. Tr amendments are typically very short. Um, you know, maybe you're adding a grandchild, you're adding a property. I typically charge um, anywhere from, it's about, a, unless it's an overhaul, you might be spending $200, $300 at most to do amendments because literally it's usually just, taking something out or adding something to it. We're not redrafting the whole document. So um, I generally, it's typically somewhere between $200, $300 to do an amendment because in a lifetime, you might amend your documents maybe two or three times, maybe. There's not a lot that changes um, because what we also do in our, at least the way I do in my trust, I always have a clause that says um, that any real estate that I own, um, belongs in this trust. Even if I didn't get to it, I still let them know. So yeah, I might have to go to probate, but I don't have to, um, If in case I forget, at least I had that language in there that it was my intention 
and that's where a pour over will comes into play that the intention was for the trust to own it and therefore if i'm leaving all these properties to my children someone couldn't come behind and you know give it to a foundation or my favorite charity even though i didn't retire that asset my trust still said any real property that i have interest in the trust belongs the trust owns it and i want you to distribute it by blah 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 Awesome. So we have time for one more question. Okay. And that question is going to be, if someone is interested in more detailed information on wills and trusts, what resources? Are there any um, books or websites that you would recommend for them to check out? It's a really good question. Um, you know, uh, um, Georgia, if you go to Georgia probate, so it's gaprobate.gov is a good resource it tells you all the forms that you'd have to be filling out um and then um there is uh, a website that you, for more detailed articles you'd have to be an attorney because you have a subscription but they have great articles um on wealthcouncil.com so um that's another good resource but you know there's people who i personally um, talk to churches a lot. So you'll find that local churches will do workshops with attorneys. The other great resource um, is pro bono clinics. Um, the, you know, Atlanta Bar has one, uh, State Bar has one. Um, Gab, while we just did one a couple months ago where we um, did uh, wills for free for people in the community who signed up. So, um, there are certainly if you want to educate yourself, I, I like Wealth Council, go to georgiaprobate.gov or call a pro bono clinic um, because a state bar, they, they do clinics and sessions all the time. And um, otherwise, obviously consult with an attorney if you're really talking about true planning, once you're ready to start planning. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you. Oh. Um, so Eileen, thank you so much. Um, this session was so informative. Um, I Number one, just your expertise alone um, has been helpful to um, well over 100 people tonight. But um, the info is so valuable. And you're right. It's a subject that our community typically does not broach. Um, so I would ask that our audience um, members reach out to Miss Eileen for um, consultation and set up an appointment to complete your trust power of attorney healthcare directive or if you still want a will um by all means please reach out to her um because i i at this point think that um her expertise is probably second to none so um with that being said i can't thank um uh, both of our presenters enough uh, miss elliott and um miss eileen eileen we really appreciate um you're taking the time to just go in great detail and to answer audience questions. So our audience, we just ask that you contact these presenters uh, for more information and to start uh, getting personalized um, information. And please, please um, scan the barcode that you see on the screen. We want to get feedback from you. We wanna make sure we continue to provide the um, information and webinars that you desire. If you have interest, uh, economic interests or topics, um, we'd like to uh, uh, create um, future programming to meet our audience needs. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you so much to our um, um chapter participants. Uh, Holly, thank you so much. Soar Clark, um, Soar Francis, Soar Crook, thank you. Uh, again, we thank you for joining. Please, please take a few moments to, to, to do the evaluation, and uh, we hope that you have a great evening. Take care.